Hi, my name is Steve Mann and welcome to CounterPoint B2B. This is a B2B marketing podcast where we take specific and critical items within B2B and debate them and see if we can come to uh, an understanding of some of the nuances of those topics and uh, so that you can make an informed decision as what approach is right for you. Today's show is Have I Become a Marketing Wallflower? So conversations get stale. If there's nothing more to talk about at a cocktail party, you just kind of move to the wall and you just kind of twiddle your fingers. And the same is true in the customer conversation cocktail party. But looking, looking back on the pandemic, while it is and it continues to be horrific, and it's something that we'll never forget and something we'll never st stop talking about, as marketeers, do we need to move on? When do we stop beginning customer conversations with COVID or pandemic? Will it stop being valuable to include them in our market conversations? What will be the precipitating events uh, to alter those conversations? Inquiring minds want to know. So today, what I've done is I've invited Sharon Spooler and Tom Trainer to um, have a discussion or debate on this uh, conversation. Sharon is the area managing partner and, fractionals and a fractional CMO with Chief Outsiders. I know Chief Outsiders are one of the top fractional uh, management consulting and leadership teams in the world. It's interesting, what they do is they provide fractional CMOs to small and growth and medium sized companies so that they can help develop uh, their growth and their go to market strategies. Tom, on the other hand, is the Chief Marketing Officer of Treasure Data, and he is responsible for building, developing, and executing their marketing strategy. Uh, Treasure Data has a, a state-of-the-art customer data platform. He's had lots of senior marketing positions uh, within the tech world, as well as consulting positions at PwC, Booz Allen, Meltwater, et cetera. Sharon, Tom, welcome. Thank you, Thank Steve. You. Great to My be pleasure. here. So um, laid out our conversation for today, we want to know when we're going to stop uh, using COVID and pandemic at the beginning of market sentences, marketing sentences. What do you think? When are we going to stop, stop doing this? It's definitely going to be less um, this summer. And I think things will change a lot more in the fall uh, and then into the new year. So I think it's it starts in the summer. Um, and I think the reason I say that is I think people's mindset is forward looking mm -hmm. and they're ready to move to more normalcy um, and to move beyond this. So they don't want to keep kind of thinking back to it and uh, referring to it. Well, normal is good and I'm psyched to get back to normal or whatever that's gonna look like. But I'm wondering why why the summer? What What's the, what's the secret sauce? What's the fairy dust that's uh, making that happen? Uh, I think the summer is the timing when most people are vaccinated, when I think the attempts to open the movie theaters, to open up sports and things like that will, will be more broad, um, mm -hmm. broadly out there. And I think people will make that attempt, uh, some portion of the people will make that attempt to kind of make it like it was before, while as others will still be maybe hesitant. So, so you're saying the pandemic is going to end the pandemic and it's going to change marketing conversations. Is I that think right? People, I'm, I'm saying mentally people want to move on. Got it. What about you, Sharon? You know, what's your thoughts on when this thing, when the market conversations are going to shift away from COVID? I think uh, smart organizations have been positioning themselves uh, as post pandemic uh, conversation for a while now. This mm -hmm. is all about uh, finding the new normal. Uh, that the customers are uh, are driving their solutions toward, driving their messaging toward. Um, in in many industries, I think that has already started. Um, I think just like Zoom fatigue is real, pandemic fatigue is real. Yeah. And like you said, we're we're kind of all tired of hearing that P word, even though it was a big uh, a big event for all of us in, in many different ways. We all felt the impact. Um, and I think that in many industries where they've had the opportunity to move on already, they have. I think it's already started. Got it. Well, you know what's bothering me? What's bothering me is the new normal. I, I mean, uh, since the beginning of the uh, crisis, I remember seeing a tweet where 
uh, a buddy of mine was saying, yeah, we're just going to have to settle into a new normal. And, you know, the first thing, you know, that came out of my mouth was like, I don't want the new normal. I like our normal normal. And so what, what does the new normal mean for you? I mean, for me, it means, oh my God, we're going to have to change. But is that new normal or is that just change? I think it's a broader range of possibilities. I think it's exciting. I think your new normal can be your old normal and your oh, new normal can be your new normal. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to change the way it was, for example, people going back into the office yeah. with a lot more flexibility coming out of this, this time, it's shown us that Zoom is a possibility. Fatigue is also a possibility. Yeah. So I think there's a possibility that people can uh, find their, their definition for what works for them. And that's the exciting part of new normal in the, in the definition. Yeah as I think about it. It's kind of like, and for those people who don't like being normal at all, it's big deal, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Change is, for some change is easier for others, <laughs> but so. So we were talking about when, and uh, you were saying that, well, uh, in the summer, and uh, then you were saying, Sharon, in the fall, um, does, does the life cycle of an organization have anything to do with like, so for example, corporate budgeting, for instance, that can happen in Q4. Do you think that can align or drive with uh, the end of uh, pandemic marketing? Well, I think there's an internal point of view for marketers and there's an external point of view for mm -hmm. marketers. And I think that budgeting cycle will drive our internal conversation around the pandemic and the impacts because we need to consider when different go-to-market motions will be a possibility. So will in-person events open up? When will that happen? Yeah. And when does that become, for example, part of our budgets again next year um, relative to you know, investing more heavily in digital or other tactics that we've, we've pivoted to over the last year? Yeah, and Tom, do you agree with that, that it's gonna be aligned with the budget cycle? Um, yeah, I mean, a couple, couple of things is one is back to the previous conversation. I think the only, as I say, the only constant is change. Yeah. I think there will be a new normal, and I think it's because of new technologies have been developed, new technologies adopted, companies have been tested out new ways of working, and some, sometimes they'll like it. So yeah, I don't think you can ever necessarily just go back. And if we think about change, I think it's not necessarily coming from us. It's one, or one of the forces. Yeah. The other forces include the, uh, you know, kind of the meetings and convention industry force, which really wants to get back to business. Mm -hmm. There's also the, uh, the attendees, some portion of them want to get out there no matter what, and another portion doesn't. So I think there's these, these different forces of what we want, what the, you know, the other stakeholders want, like the convention and meetings industry, and then what the actually attendees want. And you know, if they, if they start having events and they start to create a feeling of FOMO, like all these customers are coming, do you want to be there? You know, I think people yeah. might be pulled into, you know, starting to try these. Yeah, I, I can see that being a, a, a driver of when. My, my just tilting into the, the notion of internal corporate drivers, it, here's where I, I disagree. I disagree because I don't think... Um, the, mark, the, the marketing organization and the CFO are aligned on, we need to change our, our conversation now. I think it's a CEO, uh, CMO marketing conversation for sure. But uh, I mean, if it, was, if it was me, I would be saying, I would be making the decision and I get input from my, by, from my CEO. But at the end of the day, as the, um, as the senior responsible for marketing strategy, isn't it my job to say, here's when we should alter the conversation? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 the way I think about it, we've been flexible for the last year. Like, so we, like we've, flexible, we've, like we've gymnastic pivoted. flexible or what type of flexible? Yeah, well, that too. No, but okay. we, we pivoted very heavily, like uh, all of us in Sharon too, I'm sure. You know, and we've been flexible in terms of the way that we go to market. And mm -hmm. I, I see this as just another you know, pivot or, or change in the, you know, steering the ship a little bit, a different direction, depending on how things go. And I, I agree. It starts, it starts with us and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll run it by the stakeholders that need to know and need to approve the, you know, are we going to have people mm -hmm. flying to these events and things like that? But yeah, at the end of the day, if the events are there and it feels safe and, and uh, you know, we've got the approvals and all that, then, then, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, 
we'll shift our budget. So I, I wouldn't say our budget cycle is like, oh, we're going to have this as much as events and this much as is uh, virtual events. We can very easily shift between those and we're kind of waiting, right? We've got a bucket and we're kind of, sometimes we're signing up for events that are in person and then we know that they might shift to virtual and they've, they've communicated that. So it's kind of, we're just being flexible. So you think the event ecosystem is going to be a prime driver of when we drop COVID from our conversation? Is that, did I understand that or? No, no, I'm, I, if we go into what's getting even closer to the new normal, where we're actually doing things in person, I think the events uh, ecosystem is a big driver of that. Uh, yeah. And same with the entertainment and uh, sports and other But um, as far as the conversation, you know, Sharon's got a great point that we're already, you know, many are already starting. And I think once people are fully vaccinated and all that, it'll, it'll hopefully be, you know, a lot more people will be not communicating about it as much. I wanted to build on your comment. So yes, the CMO owns messaging, certainly. It's the go-to-market motions where you need that aligned, um, the aligned point of view from sales, marketing, finance, and the CEO, like how you deploy the message is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, being uh, being the internal internal conversation, not the external messaging. We're not going to tell customers we're now at this trade show because we think the pandemic ended. You know, right. that's not what we're talking about. It was the internal messaging that we were relaying about relaying. And I think that um, that nimbleness and and I, that's a great word, the flexibility, nimble gymnastics mm -hmm. or otherwise with how we're deploying our investment across those go-to-market motions is something I think is a lingering benefit of, um, of, of sort of what this time has provided. And I think is going back to the new normal part of the marketer's new normal is ne the need and the ability to be nimble in that way. So here's my frustration. My frustration is that I don't think the, I don't think the pandemic will ever, ever get too far from our, our brains. And maybe it'll sit, in the non-conscious, but I think it's going to be right underneath. And, and so, um, and I, I say that simply because when you look at world events, they take a long time to kind of dissipate. I mean, even we still talk about 9-11 occasionally, and this we're, we're much closer to. So is it true, is it possible that we can even stop talking about it at least like, you know, 70% of the time, or do you think it's always going to be there in some way, shape or form? It's embedded into the American psyche and the world psyche for sure. I don't think it will ever completely go away. There are many yeah. businesses who have successfully changed their model, uh, their, their offerings, their solutions for uh, based on this time. And I think, you know, for example, there is a spray tanning company that, that I talked to last year. They, they changed their sprayers from tanning booths to disinfectant sprayers. Oh, my God. Right? Seriously? And, yes, and we're able wow. to disinfect law enforcement vehicles, fire trucks, EMT vehicles within weeks, of, if not even shorter, from the beginning of this, this outbreak last year. Now, in the American psyche, in the world psyche, there is going to, I think, be a continued demand for disinfecting surfaces. <laughs> we're not going to get on an airplane and use the tray the same way we used to. Yeah. So in that way, it will be embedded in our psyche, what consumers want how it might show up as a benefit on product, you know, CPG packaging, CPG yeah. goods for a long, long time. And also, again, the flexibility of a workforce that we're now demanding, um, greater flexibility in how we work, where we work, uh, how we use our yeah. office spaces is going to be there for a long time. I, I don't know that we're going to say outright, well, this was because of the pandemic. Kind of like another thread that's been woven into our, our psyches, just like, politics and like other things that have happened I think it, yeah they don't go away from a and from a personal perspective but and from B to C I agree with Sharon's examples from from a B to B perspective it may not be as useful to talk about that it may be more about what are your goals and you know we all know that that B to B or or B to C companies are where we're selling to them to help uh, provide a, a CDP to them they may be going to market slightly differently, but we're gonna talk about what are their goals and how they're gonna improve those goals versus, oh, by, by the way, this is because of the pandemic. So we're not really gonna mention that or need Interesting. to. Interesting. So, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I did a few podcasts and I was asked, um, so should, uh, should marketing conversations change? And of course they should, right? You're, it's much more nuanced, you're, it's more conversational. You're not really selling, you're nurturing, you are trying to make people feel comfortable. And then as we got, towards the end or, or where we are now, people are more comfortable 
um, having a more standard conversation with the market. I, I, I say this because I don't want to be marketed to with pandemic messaging. I, I don't care whether it's uh, a, you know tanning salon or you know buying a widget from 3M. I, I don't I don't want this anymore. It just it reminds me it's got bad juju. And so, um, is it the case that we we even though there's this mass that's in our head about oh this horrible stuff that happened to us, do we just cut clean and don't do it at all? I think I think for you know Sharon had a really good point on B two C. I think it's just it's embedded in the the service offering, like, right? Okay. So safe dining, contactless payment, all that stuff is you know to Sharon's point is going to continue. But yeah, for 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 B two B, I don't. It, I think it's kind of like the it's we're in the period of no excuses. So let's stop talking about why you were challenged. Now let's talk about what you need to do. So yeah. you need to talk about what you need to do and how how a product or service like we're selling is going to help you is, is kind of the message. That's I like that. Point. What you need to do, Sharon? Yeah, you? that's a great point, Tom. It does always begin with the customer, whether they're a B2C or a B2B. It starts with what they're trying to achieve and, and what their reality is. You know, are they living in a product reality, a service reality that's very much geared toward getting through a pandemic? Or are they in a reality that is not been as touched by, by that question? Uh, by that, by that epidemic, uh, pandemic. Right. And, um, you know, and, and I think that's, that's not changing in marketing. That's always been the case. And so really, I think it's become even more important to get in touch with what your customers, your prospects uh, are looking to achieve. And, and I think that ultimately continues to be what guides your messaging. So it's a when or why is what I, when and why type of conversation that needs to be having. Not only is it a when, and maybe it's maybe it's a matter of it's not a specific point in time, but it's different for every single industry or even enterprise depending on their cycle. Um, and, and the why is is it more a matter of how important or not important this type of messaging is to their market and their persona. Yeah, no, I think okay. it is. I think it's exactly. I think it's the when. Yeah, will be phased in depending on on industry and yeah, you know, the, the why. Yeah, it just depends on the impact. I can't tell you. I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait. I'm COVID weary, and I'm COVID weary in every. And I, you know, I've got my vaccine, so you know, I'm happy. I can go out to dinner and stuff like that. Be careful, but um, I'm COVID weary. I, I just I, that's what's driving me to. That's what even drove me to have this conversation today. You know. So, but Karen, Chief Outsiders has to have a unique perspective, right? Because you guys are embedded in all these different industries. I think it's, I saw on the website, 60 plus industries, something like that. And um, you're, you're in growth industries, you're in midsize, you even tickle enterprise. So what is there a unique perspective that you have there, given the fact that you're hearing it from so many different uh, companies and, and, and industries? Yeah, you know, it, it is true. We're on the management team right now of, close to 150 companies, B2B, B2C, uh, different sizes, different stages. And, and there is a there are definitely a varying opinion about this topic. Uh, this could actually make for a fantastic uh, conversation starter just within our firm to, to pivot ourselves away from being the wallflowers that you, uh, you, know, that you mentioned at the beginning. How to, and where are our various, the companies that we're working with, I mean, you know, it's very real in hospitality and travel. I've worked this year with a company that provides data and analytics for the travel industry. And yeah. they're still very much talking about this topic in their customer messaging. We are in our customer messaging uh, versus other clients that have almost never had to pivot there in, in the right. way that they go. So there is a broad range. And I think the when and the why is, is again, comes back to what their end clients or their customers are seeing is their reality and how their solutions pivot to solve the the problems that are you know either relevant or or not relevant at all to what's going on in in terms of uh, COVID. So it's kind of like the industries are are threat level driven. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. one, Defcon five. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. And and have you been? I guess my my question is. Yeah. Strategy is a difficult thing, right? Every, but everybody wants to be a strategist because it sounds really cool, yeah. right? But you, it, 
it's the translation of strategy into like great tactics that are um, uh, the most important. They used to say that nobody ever got fired for I, for firing, fired from picking IBM. Is, is it the case that nobody's going to get fired for um, um, uh, both talking about the pandemic and not talking mm -hmm. about the pandemic when you're straddling both worlds? I mean, well, I mean, I, I think it comes still comes down to the data and the results. I am a data person by training and engineer. So for me, if, if the if the messaging is out there one way or the other and it is or isn't working, and this has been true long before the pandemic, long before COVID, Mm -hmm. um, you know, if the data is showing that we're not getting the response, if we're not uh, getting the conversions, if we're not seeing the nurture, we're not having the right conversation. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think that hasn't changed. So I think it comes down to the data. And you're absolutely right. Like, Tom, I love your perspective on this being feet on the ground. And um, we, we are all like we are all as CMOs about having a strategy. But man, if we can't pivot that to the right execution, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. That's where, we, where the rubber really hits the road. Tom, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the messaging has to be, you know, clear and, and bold and, and really resonate with the, the customer. And hopefully it's differentiated within your industry so you don't sound like everyone else. So I, right. I do worry about trying to play both sides that maybe you're not making a choice and you're just kind of, you know, just kind of waiting, waiting and seeing without really taking a taking a stand in one direction. So equivocation uh, is not an option. Yeah, I'd say it may be taking a stand. And then, yeah. um, you know, I was at a, a subsidiary of Amazon for a while. And I, one thing they talk about there is uh, two way doors and one way doors. So, you know, back to the flexibility topic, I think if, if uh, some things you can reverse and some things you're, you, you make the call and you're stuck with that decision, right? So it's a mm. part of your, so I think that comes into strategy is that which things are, you know, we can go a certain direction, but we can always reverse. And yeah. certain, certain things are, well, once we pick that, we're, we're in and we, you know, there's really no turning back. So I think that's, you have to know which of those kind of uh, decisions you're making. So in, um, we'll continue this conversation, but if you were to uh, provide some advice to a, you know, let's say a, you know, a marketeer that is first time responsible for both budget and to a certain degree messaging, what, what would your advice be to them uh, relative to this pandemic, non-pandemic messaging? Get in oh, touch with your you. customer. Oh my God. I, yeah, no, I would say talk to the customer. I, a lot of marketers try to do their job in a silo and get and don't have voice of customer to inform where they're at right now. Mm -hmm. So understanding what problems they're solving, what, what their reality is, how they're making their decisions. I mean, those fundamental things uh, that have always informed messaging still apply and maybe more so now mm -hmm. so that we're ensuring we're not too stale or too wallflowery with our, mm -hmm. our pandemic messaging. I, that's my first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking the same thing is that it's basically driven by those customer needs and mm -hmm. really understanding them and being able to articulate like what, how you're going to help them, you know, solve their, the problems that they're, the things that they're trying to achieve. Um, so, so are you saying it's blocking and tackling as usual, even though it's a pandemic messaging? No, no, I, I, I don't think so. So I think understanding the needs and articulating it is actually not, not just, you know, it's, it's, it even can come to thought leadership on, you know, in our in our area, we're we're helping them kind of like flesh out their Martech stack for the future. So, you know, you could call it post pandemic um, in that digital transformation. So, it can be thought leadership, right? So, if we're talking to the 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 CXOs, you know, they need to think about how to build that IT and Martech stack for the future. So, it's not just blocking and tackling; it's really having a message that. That communicates that. So it's at you know actually at, the, at all levels, not just the blocking and tackling level. So I, I use the wrong term. I, I I guess what I was trying to get across is that we would do this even if there wasn't a pandemic. We would go out and talk to customer. We would go out and try to do you know full stack changes to our our messaging based on market events. So so I guess what I'm hearing you say is nothing's going to change just because we are, you know, moving away from pandemic messaging and pandemic referencing. 
All right, it's time, time for a refresh. Uh, you know, if they haven't done a refresh of their own messaging, they need to do it now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're saying it's, a, it's an optimal time to be doing that. Okay. Yeah. And to build on it, though, the reason why is we've never seen this amount of VUCA, right? VUCA, V-U-C-A, volatility, uncertainty, change, and ambiguity. We've great, never a, seen, great acronym. <laughs> yeah, right? We've never seen this level of VUCA. So with the, the more VUCA, the more you need to be checking in and grounding yourself in those customer needs. So while the process of understanding customer needs and using that to develop your messaging is the same, the mm. frequency and the potential for iteration and changes is, is, is increased during this time. So it's kind of like the, the tool is the same, but what you're going to yield from using that tool could be very different. Right. Yeah, I think the range of possibilities is wider now too, to build on what you just said. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's interesting because it, even though you could use the same tools, it may be that people are still scratching their head and say, okay, I don't know what to do with this. Right. Which is always the case, but I, I think you're right in the sense that the pandemic has brought to the surface all these different approaches and it's uh it's uh, the smart marketeer will have to sift through those very carefully. And, and to Sharon's earlier point, maybe you're developing your messaging and monitoring it for six months and making another change and being ready to change it versus in the past where you might have said, well, th we're going to set this and come back to it a year later. But, you know, you, you might want to monitor and, and be ready to change it. So keep the keep the tools warm. So channel optimization will be even more important. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Channel optimization is huge. It's something we spend literally every every week or every day. On, we're talking about channel trade offs and rock and roll. Yeah. yeah. So um, oh, this has been really exciting. I've really appreciated this. A couple more questions though for you. So um, have you guys read a non marketing book in the last two months? Have you read it I, the last two months? I, I can start. So um, I usually read one one marketing book and then sometimes. Uh, dabble in a non mark uh, sorry, one, one non-marketing book and then dabble in a marketing or business book. So I, uh, yeah, I, I'm reading a Hyperion. It's an older science fiction book. Kind of, I know kind Hyperion. Of going, going for the escapism uh, <laughs> approach. One of my favorites. I, I love Hyperion. What about you, Sharon? You know, I, um, I guess it's not a marketing book. I'm a big fan of anything by Lencioni on the business side. So anything that Patrick Lencioni puts out, I, I'll gobble up. And I think he's a relatively prolific and will usually publish something a year. I can't remember if it was in the last two or three months, but, uh, but certainly anything there. And um, I've been, a, you know, on the non-business side, you know, I just like a good escape read. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'll read a, a Follett book or um, I'm a long-term uh, kind of Tolkien fan. And so I have kids the age that are reading all of the, the trilogy now. And uh so I'm rereading some of that uh, as I go through the experience through their eyes um, over these last uh, months. So uh, I guess an oldie but a goodie is being revisited in our family during this time. So, so Tom, are you, would you say that you are, your favorite genre is sci-fi? Uh, I mean, for escape is in sci-fi or you know detective or you know just I, I try to uh, dabble in some different different kinds just to see you know whatever is an interesting story. Cool. Uh, Barry, you, you're all over the place as well in terms of you, you can you're fluid with regards to genre i am i like good historical fictions too and um uh literature um i have a, a minor in basically slavic lit so I'll, i call it a glutton for punishment and read a bunch <laughs> of, you know a bunch of dostoevsky Chekhov and and tolstoy over the years so yeah pretty pretty broad range of genres i guess if you look at it that way cool well, listen, I want to thank both of you for joining me today. This has been a really uh, fun conversation. This has been CounterPoint B2B. Thank you very much.